Okay, we're ready, it goes. Uh, welcome to the council meeting of November the 5th, 2019. We'll have a moment of silence to start. Approval of the agenda. It's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The council approves the agenda for its regular meeting of November 5th, 2019, with the addition of item 6, uh, 5, no, 6B, uh, the remaining centennial gold plated coins. All in favor? Unanimous. Any declaration of uh, pecuniary interest? Councillor Owen? Yeah, I'm going to declare declaration of pecuniary interest on the uh, treasurer's report I can't find it here on the uh, update of the uh, waterworks water. wastewater even though there's no um, instruction being given on that I just want to play it safe okay duly noted petitions and delegations Mike Romain and Mr. Preston Team Northern Throttle. Please.
Can I call on uh, Ashley Bilodov to respond? Okay, so we did uh, we did split the reports up. We felt that it was necessary to address them individually. From an airport perspective, nothing's really changing. There is the rec or the four hundred and ten dollar daily charge that they are in th they are planning on paying. So there was no issues there. It's just a matter of whether or not council wants to entertain the um, the closing of the airport for those those days that they're there. So that's where that report ends. The the snow drakes, like uh, Mike has mentioned, there was a little bit of concerns there with some costs that were incurred as a result of keeping uh, that area of the snow dump clear. Uh, and like he did mention, we did meet earlier today and came up with some recommendations in order to move forward with this. So moving into 2020, what we wanted to try, or sorry, moving into this race here and then uh, in the future, uh, we are proposing that there is no user fee for the next one. However, we look at uh, tracking and doing a better job at getting a handle of those expenses for 2020 to determine exactly what it is that we're doing over and above. Uh, and at that point, we can develop a user fee that's fair. We also said, uh, we also agreed that we were looking at pushing back the, um, the sort of runway a little bit, the track, <coughs> 20 to 30 feet to the north so that it gives us 20 to 34 more feet to be able to put snow down. So that will help or should help. Uh, and again, it'll be contingent on our review this year when we take a really good look at it uh, to bring some recommendations forward for next year. The other thing we wanted to bring up, and this is something that our roads foreman did mention, was that there is some uh, legislation coming forward, potentially with MECP, so Ministry of Environment, uh, where we're, we're gonna have to start worrying about the control of leachate in our snow dumps. It hasn't been passed yet, but there is um, indication that it may get passed, which may affect um, them being able to use the snow dump. Uh, so in that, with that understanding, we looked at whether or not there was other areas in town that we could potentially host it. So those are all things we're going to look at in the next year. Um, so like I said, the recommendation for us moving forward is 2020. Let's not charge, uh, but we will look at in figuring out what those costs are and potentially implement a user fee for the 2021 season. Ashley, has there been any meeting with the group prior to these invoices being sent out? Not the invoices, but in the agreements that we recently, we did the agreement, the new agreements, what, last year or the year before? Yeah, we had them reviewed by a, a lawyer, and that was uh, as a result of the former CAO who wanted our agreements to be holding up and, and reflective of today's language. So we actually had our agreements all modified. So anything that's above and beyond uh, uh, something no, that, that's not in the... Sorry? Anything above and beyond normal wear and tear. Or anything that's incurred cost-wise gets billed back to the applicant. So that's in the agreements. <coughs> They're probably, I'm not sure if there was notice sent before the invoice was given or, yeah. Not a lot of the Okay. <coughs> Councillor Ivanov? Yeah, Mike, you know, I, I was, person who took over, one of the people who took over after uh, the town gave it up after they ran it for five years and they, they claimed to lost money and we made money every year. Uh, so I'm, th that was the summer event. Uh, the issue you have there is the rainouts and that's where the concern is with the rainouts. And then I think we had that guy from Ottawa, Arnie. Yeah, the heck was it? yeah he was the guy that was, because he, he wanted to get paid regardless of whether uh, it was a rainout or not. But that, aside from that, the events always made money. So I'm just surprised that you guys are at a loss or, or at a, at less than a break even. What happened, uh, I would say in the last probably 10 years, nine to 10 years, is fundraising has just been constantly
Yeah, I don't recall us having that kind of uh, sponsorship either. It wasn't it wasn't huge after the town uh, let it go, but there was uh, still some there was some sponsorships involved, yeah. But certainly not never losing money. Mike, uh, you ask what does the dozer do exactly in <coughs> the trucks? How, uh it's it's been explained um, to us personally at our at the meeting that we had this afternoon. Okay. So what happens is the, the truck dumps on the edge of the bank, and then when the truck can't dump anymore, so he might get five or six loads over the bank, and then he has to push the snow over. And that's how it was explained to us. So if it's on a lower section of the hill, they may only get two or three dumps before the dozer has to push. So de depending on how many dumps they can do over the bank before the dozer is where the costs incur from what we understood. Now if he can't dump on the hill, which he would dump in the lower area, so I guess the dozer would be used more to push the snow further. It, did this, is it this issue that came up about what exactly we, we do out there uh, due to last year's uh, heavy snowfall. Uh, part of the issue, Rick, I, I don't know why, that's why I'm curious. Or is, I, I, believe, I believe it was. I, I think they said there was only two times where we actually had to go, they actually There's had to say. In six years. Yeah, and last year was a record year. Like it, there was a lot of snow. Yeah. So we had to push, we had to, hold back snow in that area in order to accommodate them, yeah. which cost additional funds, so. Yeah. So it's, it's extra employment it, it, of the it, equipment it, and, and staff uh, partially due to the snowfall. Yeah, it's it, a combination of staff time and hired equipment. Yeah. yeah. Councillor White. Sorry, this is just uh, from Mike's note here. Um, you said you're a non-for-profit? And but you can't get a lottery license. Why not? Not for profit. Not non profit. Oh, uh, okay. So is that why? Sorry, Joanne's the lottery. <laughs> expert. We, yeah, we've been through this uh, a number of years. Um, they are an adult hobby group, so it's it's adults who are, are racing. Even though that they, they do open up to children, there is a fee to get into the gate. So it's not open to anybody who walks through. There is a there is a admission fee there is a fee in order to race um, there's they don't fit the criteria for lottery licensing but we've yeah. been through it a number of times and yeah. it's correct councillor Ivanov the only other thing I, I would suggest is if you brought us your financials and show us something that you're not making money then you know we would be you know it's I, I think we would like to see that because as councillors if we're going to give something away we'd certainly like to know absolutely what's happening. Mm -hmm. Councillor Owen. Yeah, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Team Northern Throttle for the work they do in the town. It's not really big on my list of things to do, but it's big on a lot of people's things to do, and I just want you to know that we appreciate it. Um, as for the invoices, um, I believe if the town is paying extra, we should invoice the group that's responsible, but I do see a problem in this case, and I, and I also see the problem in, in Mike's uh, printout that he handed us, and it seems to be communication. There seems to be a lack of accurate and good communication between the volunteer group and the employees at the town of Kirkland Lake. And I'm sure, yes, when I was involved with uh, not-for-profit or non-profit or whatever, terminology one is the proper term 
if all of a sudden I got a couple of invoices that I wasn't expecting and hadn't booked on, I would not be happy. So I appreciate where you're coming from. As a counselor, I say, yes, I think they're legitimate charges, but in the future, we need to work on communication. We need to have two-way communication so both groups. I would only call it legitimate if you could explain to me what the number is. Well, I don't know. Okay, I'm assuming. <clears throat> okay, I make, like, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operation, and if they said they used lumber, I'm assuming that they did. Um, that's a discussion that not even I'm allowed to get into. So, um, but nonetheless, there has to be better communications. Because yes, if I were you sitting at that table, I probably wouldn't be as calm as you are right now. I'd probably be a lot up, more upset. In terms of keeping track of the costs this year and then coming up with a user fee, I think that's a fair thing to do. Um, I think that's fair to the town and also fair to the, to the group. So I certainly would support that as well. But I, I want to encourage you guys to keep going, even though you may want to punch us in the nose every once in a while. But we have other pressures that, that you don't have. So we have to be careful, too. Thank you. So to satisfy your, the outcome here, what exactly are you looking for, Mike? Uh, what we would like to do is keep the snow dump as is with no user fee for this year track where we're going track what it costs and see for next year about the snow dump i want to come up with a way a knowledgeable way of knowing that how they're costing what money though because just giving me 7500 dollars i get that you had to have a bulldozer you had the bulldozer every year there was a huge snow amount this year <clears throat> what part of our concern too is there's you, you have contractors out there that collect snow uh, I mean our, on, on our street we paid eight hundred dollars just to have our snow section dumped with the snow dump. Those people we paid for it. And you guys were mo moving that snow for free. I mean you want to charge us who is a user group who is doing things for the community money to do the same thing. Just doesn't seem right. Those are people profiting from the town. We're not. I mean, <coughs> so I think you're going after the wrong. Blair, what? Yeah. Yep. Councillor White. So contractors in the town dump removed snow from private property and dump it at the snow dump. I'll get Steve to answer that one. I'm not sure. As explained, as I explained earlier this evening to the to Mike and, and uh, could you speak up a bit? Oh, sorry. Please? As I explained in the meeting that we had, the increased cost isn't difficult to figure out. When you dump a load of snow over an embankment that's 60 feet high, or an embankment that's only 12 feet high or 15 feet high, you have to do less work. You can dump more loads of snow over a 60 foot embankment than you can over a 12-foot embankment before you have to push it. There's the, <coughs> there's the additional cost. So this mystery as to where the money, where the cost is incurred is not a mystery at all. It's common sense. I didn't say it was a mystery. I asked for it to be defined on how much extra it's costing. Again, and then, and then the, I was misquoted. Or actually, I wasn't quoted properly at all. The, the uh, Northern Thunder people said that I wanted to close the snow dump in February. I do not. I start closing the, the snow dump, closing it by the meaning I don't push the snow anymore at the end of March. So I let the snow dump fill in, as was done years previous, following in the footsteps of my predecessors, doing the same thing to reduce costs. Anyway, that being said, I would like to answer your question again, if you could repeat it, please. Okay. Councillor White. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I, this is like an operational, just wrap my head around things. So private contractors in town go and dump the snow I in have, our? The, 
these, these, again, there's a little bit of confusion on that one. If the contractors have to dump in the snow dump at the good fish snow dump, they, are, they push the piles. So it's no cost to us except for the room. I've opened up, I've opened up the snow dump at Archer Drive for the contractors to use. That is their snow dump. Yes, contractors have used the good fish snow dump. I allow them to do it on the condition that they push the snow that they dump. Do you, are you saying that they bring a mm -hmm. bulldozer d over to the where they're dumping their snow? They have brought loaders. They have and uh, they have used. Uh, the, I believe one one contractor contracted uh, the dozer operator that we used to do his snow. Yes, Councillor Owen. Okay. Well, that's a whole new ball game for me. I would think it's the private contractor's responsibility to have their own lot to put their snow on, and if we're providing them with a lot, we should be charging them for it. We're leaving revenue on the table. Why are we doing a service free for people that are making money? We should be charging them, or they should have their own snow dump. But we shouldn't be just giving them a place to put their snow, that's a cost of doing business. And they should be paying something. We can't leave, we can't afford to leave money on the table. What's your thoughts on that, Steve? Uh, well, I've, uh, I've had several thoughts on that over the years uh, of my employment here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the cost of monitoring a system like that increases. Uh, it would increase our cost to try and monitor all the contractors who dump snow whenever they take it, uh, because it, it is indeed after hours. Um, and uh, the cost associated with having somebody work on overtime to see who dumped how many loads where and charge them per load, or uh, an annual fee is another option. Uh, but how much would you charge Snow contractor, that, snow contractor that moves in 250 loads of snow compared to one that maybe do 40. Again, you're going to get, it's, it's kind of a complicated thing that's, that's not that easy to do. Yes, it would be a stream of revenue, but it would also be a stream of expense. Uh, before we go to councillors, Ashley. Can I just suggest that maybe we bring a report to council back and explain what we've done and where there's room for improvement or if there's any room for improvement or why we've done it? That way we can get it wrapped in our heads before we present it. Is that okay? Great. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, I'll work on that. Councillor Casey. <laughs> Owens. <Okay>. Owens. <laughs> I'm good for now. I'll wait for a report yeah. to come out and I'll ask my question on that one. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Owen. Yeah, since they're going to be working on a report, I'd like a little bit further input. There's something called a flat rate. Okay. Right now we're giving them the use of our land free of charge. That's not right in my opinion. There's something called a flat rate. How many times they use the property during that flat rate? It's their business. It's not our problem if one guy only puts 10 loads and another guy puts 1,000 loads. You charge a flat rate. The administration costs are virtually nothing. You don't have to monitor it. And at least the, the rate payers get some return for a service we're now providing free to for-profit companies. I agree with Ashley. We need uh, a further staff report on this before we can uh, see what we can do for uh, your group as well. Are you okay with that? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> no, we see, we do recognize yeah. your point. I, it, it, it is a point. If, if one company is dumping 30 loads over the bank and we have to pay for that, extra dozer fees, why are we paying for it when they're making money off of it? That's, that's, that's the hard one for us to swallow. Okay. Uh, Steve? Again, if I might rebuttal, we don't push their snow they push their own. So it's still snow over the bank snow. though, Steve. Again, you're talking about costs. Don't confuse the two, please, because it's not the same thing. Okay, I think we're 
going to move on. We have mm -hmm. a direction. I have a resolution that is moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier. The Council approves the request from Team Northern Throttle to ut utilize the Goodfish Snow Dump for two snow drag race events on January 24th to 26th and March 20th to 22nd, 2020, with no charge as per the presentation by the Manager of Planning and Land Development. Any further discussion? All in favor? I have, a sec I have a second resolution for the airport. Um, the council, uh, so it's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The council approves the request from Team Northern Throttle to util utilize the airport to operate the drag races from June 10th to 15th, 2020. All in favor? Approved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Ashley and Rick. Uh, acceptance of the minutes and recommendations. So it's moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier. The Council accepts the minutes of the following meetings. The Police Service Board meeting held October 28, 2019. The meeting to open sealed quotations to purchase scrap metal from the KL landfill site held October 29th, 2019. The Committee of the Whole held October 29th, 2019. The regular meeting of Council held October 29th, 2019. And the special meeting of Council, which was held October 30th, 2019. All in favor? Unanimous. Reports of uh, municipal officers and communications. Uh, I'd like to speak on behalf of the Police uh, Services uh, Board, meeting that uh, Councillor Owen and myself attended. And there was a number of recommendations that came forward. Uh, I just want to remind people that these are recommendations uh, that are going to staff to consider and come back with a report to uh, to council. So they're not etched in stone by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we're looking at introduction of a four-way stop at Tweedsmere, Harding, and Algonquin. Uh, also uh, have the Town of Kirk Lake staff contact the City of Sudbury to see how the erection of vertical bars has on uh, traffic calming influence. Uh, I've seen them in Ottawa where my daughter lives out in the country a bit. Uh, they certainly do slow you down. I don't know how this would work uh, during the summer months or uh, winter months so there are some concerns there. Uh, they're basically uh, the plastic guards that are placed every 15-20 uh, feet in the middle of the road. It does slow the traffic down, but uh, where I've seen them, they don't get the winters that, that we do, so I think we have to look further at that. Uh, we're looking at uh, recommending that yield signs in th these three major areas be uh, changed and that uh, they be changed from yield to stop signs and look at a long range planning for the uh, other yield uh, areas in, in the town. Uh, laneway speed limits, uh, differing back to planning again, if enforced, uh, speed in the laneways will Town of Kirk Lake have to increase standards. Uh, there's a lot of laneways that are not accessible, but there still are a number that are. Uh, one way on four to six government road west that's over here right next to the uh, hotel and uh, legal firm have a look at that uh, 
there are some issues there if there's going to be a parking lot uh, as well for the hotel so uh, there are some concerns the speed limit on government road west at goldthorpe uh, this was a long winded discussion but i think it was very productive and what uh, police board uh, service board recommended was that council petition the mto to transition the speed from 80 70 down to 60 uh, then it would hit 50 just before Archer Drive as it is now to slow down the traffic and uh, uh, eliminate some of the danger and safety that's people trying to come off of Goldthorpe. Uh, parking lot at 22 and to 24 Government Road West. Uh, that has to come back to officially as part of the uh, bylaw. It's already been done. Uh, the bylaw hasn't been done. That's the problem. Uh, crossing guard at 2nd Street and Churchill. Uh, again, service board recommended a three-way stop at the intersection and remove or relocate the accessible parking spot from in front of the restaurant and paint crosswalk markings across 2nd on both sides of Churchill. As we know, there's heavy traffic there early in the morning with students and uh, and also from on, on 2nd Street. Uh, so there's, there's a safety issue there. So we'll have a resolution then to uh, recommend uh, that that go back to uh, the planning department to make recommendations. Moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier, that Council has accepted the Police Service Board recommendations concerning traffic and parking bylaw amendments and forward to the Planning Department for consideration. Before we vote, sorry, is there any discussion on that? Any concerns? Councillor Owen? Yeah, I, I didn't think of this at the time of the Police Board meeting, but the uh, erection of vertical bars, um, I'm not sure that would be all that effective in uh, on streets where we don't have curbs because they're just going to pull wider like those vertical bars tend to make me feel claustrophobic when I'm driving right and if you don't have a curb there I'm not sure that they'll be as effective that's just something I thought of since the meeting I would tend to agree the ones I've seen are have all curbs uh, along both sides of the road so that's something that uh, obviously has to be taken into consideration. Any further comments or discussion before we vote? All in favor? Passed. Uh, 2019 operating results. Uh, you should have received a copy of, of them. Uh, you'll have a little time to digest and that'll come back for discussion on uh, November the 19th with the treasurer involved. Uh, Joanne on the Santa Claus Parade. So, uh, council did do a parade permit on, I think it was, um, we did it on September 17th, but during the meeting in September, where council um, agreed to to, um, to do the parade for November 22nd. Chamber of Commerce has come back and said that uh, they need to change that date to November 29th. So this is just a request from the chamber asking to move that date and to notify everybody the, of the change of date. So I have a motion. It's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The Council approves the request from the Chamber of Commerce to change the date of the Santa Claus Parade to Friday, November 29th, 2019. All in favor? Passed. So the next item, um, I do not have, uh, there's not a report linked to the agenda, but this has to do with the gold coin project uh, that was done this summer for the centennial year. 
So there, um, there were approximately 3,200 gold-plated coins that were commissioned for the town centennial celebration. Uh, the price was set at these for $15 each. There was a generous, generous benefactor who purchased coins and one of these coins was given to each of the school-aged children in the Kirkland Lake area. Uh, the Centennial Committee was in charge of this and they did, they did send, uh, sell a majority of the coins, but there are approximately 800 of those coins that are left over that are now in the possession of the town of Kirkland Lake. They do belong to the town of Kirkland Lake. Uh, the museum is selling them currently at the original price of $15. And uh, so what we're asking council for is a decision on what to do with the leftover eight, 800 coins. So the suggestion is, and, and the recommendation from, uh, from staff, is that council approve that 200 of these gold-plated coins be given to uh, the 100th anniversary to hand out to the volunteers at the volunteer night on November 8th. And we're asking council to approve the sale of the remaining 600 coins at a reduced rate um, to, to try to sell them and get them in the hands of people uh, prior, prior to them being not valid, which is after the 100th year. So staff's suggestion is that we sell them at a cost of $500, or, or sorry, $5 each. <laughs> 500. I'll take two. So that's, our, that's our, our request for you to discuss. I just also wanted to let you know that this whole gold coin project also included the 100 solid gold coins each, and these gold coins were 99.9% solid Kirkland Lake gold, which is very unique. Um, we did sell 100 of them at a cost of $2,000 each. Uh, it was a very successful project, and we sold out almost immediately. There is a profit uh, to date of approximately $10,000, a little over $10,000 that was made by, by this project. Um, we will bring a report back to Council at a later date as to where you would like to put the profits from this, which will also include going forward the sale of these, um, these other coins if that's what Council would like to do. Um, the suggestion from, from the, the, the gentleman who helped us, the originator of this project, is that the, the profits be put towards the Museum of Northern History, and he has asked that I please bring that forward to you, but that will again come back in a report at a later date. Uh, today, all we're asking for is what would Council like to do with these remaining 800 coins. So we're, again, our recommendation is that 200 of them be given to the, um, the volunteers who are going to the volunteer appreciation evening on the 8th, and that we sell the rest of them at a cost of $500 each. $5 a piece. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I'm looking to make money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fact is, after the end of the year, or which is not very far off, they're not going to be worth a heck of a lot, and be difficult to certainly sell them at uh, fifteen dollars a piece. Uh, I think it's a nice gesture to give the volunteers uh, uh, a, a set of. Well, it's not a set; it's one coin with. It's nicely packaged. That I think council members all received one. Uh, it would recognize their their efforts and uh, thank them for everything that they did during the uh, centennial uh, celebrations. Uh, the other aspect of trying to sell them at five dollars a piece, uh, I think we can have some at uh, reduce the price at the uh, the museum and plus try and sell some downstairs. Uh, have a have them on display uh, it's still a lot of coins to get rid of uh, the other thing is that uh, from time to time if the, we don't sell them all off uh, within the next few months is that we are constantly getting requests from uh, different event uh, coordinators to uh, where they put bags together or uh, for conventions or meetings and uh, uh, we would have something that possibly we could hand out it's it's a pretty nice package there's no question about that any thoughts from uh, council councillor Perry I agree totally with what you're saying uh, we got to get rid of it we're just going to collect dust sitting in the, in the safe somewhere anyway so yeah. I agree with you 100 percent that thank you 
Okay, so okay. I have two resolutions. Uh, the first one is moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Stacy White, that uh, Council approves that 200 gold-plated coins uh, be donated to the volunteers of the Centennial Celebrations. All in favor? Right. Passed. And the second one is moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Stacy White, that Council approves the sale of the gold-plated medallion coins at a price of five dollars each. All in favor? Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> uh, Director of Community Services, Investing in uh, Canada Infrastructure Program. If you can give us an update. Certainly. I've asked Chad Fong, our maintenance coordinator, to come along because if there's specific questions about the building, he will be able to answer them better than I will. So you did receive the report to Council last week that explained that um, we were working with Petrowski Consulting to get financial figures for you. Um, they've been working very hard. They've done a very full building analysis, building condition analysis, which is excellent for us. They've given us numbers as of um, about 10 to 4 this afternoon. So I know that that's not enough time for you to digest the numbers, to look at them. Um, what I'm proposing is that I think this is a very important fund that we will not have the opportunity again. The funding application is due Tuesday, which doesn't leave us a lot of time, a week from today. Um, if, if you have the availability, I would like to ask if we could do a special meeting so that I could get you the information ahead of time, you have the time to review it, and then we can discuss what you would like us to move forward with. Um, timelines are tight. Uh, I will start with when I think is ideally, if we could do it tomorrow, that would be fabulous. Um, if that doesn't work for your schedules, I'm open to anything. Just the more time I have to work on the application, the better it is. And then I can, what I can do is I can, whatever your preference is, I can get you the information electronically or paper copy in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, one of the things we discussed this morning, Bonnie, uh, was that uh, we should go ahead with the application it's not to say we're going to be approved. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in line with a number of other communities, no doubt. Uh, but if we do get approved, will we have that ability to reduce the amount that we use? You're going to see. Yes, I did speak with our regional advisor okay. today, and they recommend that we don't put in um, a padded application if we don't think we can fund it. Because what that means is. So they it, say they gave us the money, that means that someone else doesn't get it. So they would like us to look as honestly as we can as what the town wants to fund. If we have to scale back, it is possible, but they're highly recommending that we apply for what we feel is reasonable for our town. And I understand that because once the money is allocated, that means that another municipality down the highway maybe didn't get the money. So that was the advice that we heard from her. The other thing, just to give you a heads up, she said this is going to be a very big intake of money, uh, sorry, of uh, applicants. It is both provincial and federal dollars that are coming together. So we are um, competing in a sense against communities across Canada as well as across the province. We had spoken in the past about putting in multiple applications. The town is eligible to put in as many as they want, but you are competing against yourself. So what they said is make sure that if you put in more than one application, you'll be completely fine with any one of them being chosen because there's no guarantee that more than one would be chosen. They do try to be regional in their representation. So we may have put something in for something that we don't feel as passionate about, but we think is a good thing. And if that's where they give us the dollars and there was something else we felt much more passionate about, we might get that passed over. So she said there is no rhyme nor reason. Um, not, not that there's no rhyme nor reason. There's no rule born in the guidelines for that, but she said that's the, the impression that they're getting from the provincial um, staff that are giving the regional advisors the information. So we're, we're just looking at the one application then, Bonnie? That well, I think that's council's decision. So I was prepared based on the last time council met was to prepare two two applications. One was for the multi-purpose category, which is the over five million, which was the rehabilitation of the community complex, and one was the uh, renovation. I think it's called for less than five million, which was accessible playgrounds. So, I mean, when we look at the dollars tomorrow, or I'm saying tomorrow, whenever it, if we, if you would decide to have a, another meeting just for this, we can you can give me further direction. 
two applications, one application more. I believe that, uh, well, I know that both the library and the museum were reached out to a number of times by Wilf, and I sent them links to some webinars. I don't know what they're, I, do you know, Stacy, by any chance, by sitting on the boards, if they've... Okay, so I don't know if ooh, I don't know if you want to look at their application as well to decide what their I, I I just I'm not involved in the museum. The deadline for the applications, I understand, I believe, is Tuesday. Correct. Yeah. So th it's pretty time relevant for sure. Uh, Councillor Casey Owens, I'd be in favor if we get a copy of the paper version or electronic, yep. whichever one's easiest, and maybe come back tomorrow and have a proper discussion about this as to where we're going. Because I'm not willing to just participate in yeah we're going forward but then come back and bite us in the butt a few and then we ran a few months down the road, <coughs> a few years down the road and if we're held accountable for something we can't afford to pay mm -hmm. or we have to pay a large amount of money to be able to cover well uh, I understand what you're saying and you can't just make an application and then if you walk away from it uh, it doesn't not going to look good. Yep. That's why we need to have a yeah. have a look at the documents, see what it entails, like what are the costs, and then have a discussion. Okay, wh what do we feel comfortable going forward with? Yeah. Councillor Owen, oh, sorry, Stacy. Stacy. Um, yeah, definitely because during the discussions previously, we had the museum and the library um, included, and in this report, they're not like they're not represented. So we definitely need to get them on board too. So if anybody that's in charge of anything could uh, definitely have their reports too, if we're gonna meet tomorrow, so that we know where they stand and if they're going to meet the deadline as well, I'd appreciate that. I can reach out to them both if you'd like me to. I'm just looking, <laughs> I'm looking to someone for her. <laughs> Councillor Owens. Yeah, I'd like to see more than oh. the figures. I want to see why this work has to be done. Mm -hmm. The That's figures included. aren't enough um, because I've been doing some of my own research and it doesn't necessarily jive with, with some of the things we've been told. Also, I'd like to know, um, at the Recreation Committee meeting, a recommendation was made that um, the players' benches be enlarged and that would resolve a number of issues it would take that doorway outside the blue line where the players enter the ice so that would look after going being offside when you step on the ice it would take that doorway away from the hallway coming up from the dressing room so when you're coaching you don't have players running into you it would also um, give the gold miners a larger bench which they would make coaching and playing easier for them and I thought it was a good recommendation I know it wasn't in the originals but I would like to see uh, some consideration given to that there has been yes. in the application as well which but I definitely um, have some concerns about living beyond our means here and I want to make sure that we're doing what only what absolutely has to be done because quite frankly, I don't feel the ratepayers in this town have the stomach to continue to fund big ticket items for recreation. And I've heard that from a number of residents. So I want to make sure that this is pared down to things that only have to be done, that are a must do. And I think that's uh, what people elected us to do, to bring up the hard questions and, and to bring change. So that's what I'm speaking up for now. Uh, Councillor White. Yeah, we definitely do acknowledge that Bonnie put it forward that not to pad the request. Mm -hmm. I think that's very smart fiscally for the taxpayers as well for its better chances, right? Mm -hmm. If we actually get this money, we'll actually be able to do the projects. So I definitely think we're all on the same page, both staff and council, that we don't want to pad this application. We want it to be reasonable for for everybody involved. Chad? Uh, I would like to ask, uh, like what you're saying, what you're saying about, like there, the, these things aren't wants or 
like uh, a thing that you know would be nice everything on our list is is legit and it needs to be taken care of I will bring information to the next meeting to uh, let everybody know where I'm coming from thank you so uh, are we talking about a special meeting then tomorrow that is, uh, is if council can can make tomorrow we can do it tomorrow we can give notice tonight after this meeting to make sure that there is notice given um, as far as time uh, councillor Adams is not here this week so I don't know if anybody can if you want to set a, a time that's a little earlier than the 440 but uh, if everybody can come I believe I the Stacey. bell goes at 305 I'm available after 305 yeah, so it's if we can say maybe 330 tomorrow mm -hmm. so we'll set a meeting for tomorrow at 330 a special meeting to discuss this and I'll send out electronic copies um, as soon as I get home tonight so you'll all have them and if if when you look at it tonight there's something you want me to investigate tomorrow prior to the meeting please let me know that because I I'm on the phone a lot with Petrowski they're very good so don't be shy to ask I'd rather be able to get the, the answers for you and we can give more explanation as well like I mean so you'll see the this, the um, report that we have it's 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 quite detailed so you'll see all the electrical items what specifically it is why it's been identified as a priority so they've helped us classify whether the existing is in poor shape fair shape good shape what the life expectancy of it is if we've surpassed it and how many years left so it's it's fairly comprehensive um, I think it will help you prioritize things much better than just a list did they do a physical inspection yes they did okay yeah They've been to our building. They spent time digging around in the all the HVAC, plumbing, electrical, roofing. Is that a previous report, or is that a how recent was that? They've been here. They, they've done two reports for us. So one was in April of 2018, and now they've updated it with now brand new 2019 October 2019, November. Okay. We're November 2019. So we'll defer this then. Is that okay? Okay. Thanks, Bonnie, Chad. Just on closing of that, this particular uh, uh, prog program, uh, I think Bonnie had mentioned this at the last meeting. We will probably never see this happen again at least while we're on council. I speak for myself. Uh, <laughs> hope to be still alive then. Uh, so I think it is important we put in some type of uh, uh, application for sure. <laughs> you, you and I, Rick, yeah. <laughs> is that harassment? No. <laughs> And I'm not in. I, I'm not opposed to putting in an application. No, no. I, and none of us are. I don't. And think. And, and I'm all in favor of, of putting in an application. I just want to make sure that we're living within our means, and we're only going to be spending money on things that are absolutely necessary, and that we remember that the ratepayers of this town have to pay 27 percent right. of of the cost of the project, and that's going to have to come out of the levy. So it's not free money. No, it certainly isn't, but it's a decent offer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Manager of Planning and Land Development, Ashley Billado and Rick. <laughs> yeah, I have Rick, I have Rick, Rick coming Bilodeau. as well, <laughs> just to help with a couple of these. So the first report that I have here for you is the acquisition of the Kirkland Lake Landfill Contamination Attenuation Zone. So. Uh, this is essentially fulfilling a condition on our ECA, our environmental compliance approval. We had a deadline of June 30th, 2020 to acquire the groundwater rights uh, to the I want to get this east and north of the landfill. Uh, so we did go ahead and proceed with uh, that. We have the agreement signed and the restricted covenant signed on the landowner's end. So at this point, it's just a matter of council authorizing mayor and clerk to go ahead and sign not, and um, proceed with acquiring those groundwater rights from a land registry perspective. So 
So is there any questions on this report at all? Councillor Owen. Uh, yeah, the $105,620, is that already in your budget? Yes. Okay. Yes. That, I just wanted to make sure. Yep. It was a carryover from, it was carryover from previous years because this has been a uh, project that's taken since probably 2010 or longer than that. 2002. 2000, oh, like 2002. Okay. So it's been a project that's been carrying over for several years. This one here, uh, there is only, this is a phase one of phase two, so don't think that I'm under budget by $50,000. I'm not, but 50 is allocated towards another acquisition on the, on the other side of the landfill. Okay, you just saved me from having another heart attack. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That'll come back as a bylaw. Possible location of the uh, works department garage and fire hall relocation. So this is sort of a joint report and we've had several people provide information on it. So I may, depending on the questions that come up, pull the necessary people up to uh, answer those questions. Uh, so this is something that's come up uh, on two different occasions with two different departments. Uh, we looked at the garage relocation within the 2019 budget, and that was a result of some money that was set aside back in 2016 to replace the garage roof. So that's where it started. Uh, the garage roof, when they did the uh, review, they did a structural analysis, and the steel supporting system wasn't able to hold that garage roof. And they also recommended that we put the project completely on hold until we can figure out where we relocate the garage. So in 2019, we did carry over the funds for the garage roof, and we allocated them to reviewing opportunities for relocating the garage. So this has been in the works for a little while. When we look at relocating the garage, Dunfield site is, uh, if anyone's been there, you can tell that there's not very much room for growth. Uh, we're currently encroaching on hospital land with our sand and salt. The uh, garage, we would have to tear it down and rebuild within the same construction season, which would be very difficult to do because it is a big building. Uh, the, the equipment that's housed in the garage needs to be warm or else we run into problems with the equipment. Uh, I don't think it's capable of being done, so I, I'm a little concerned about that. Also with the relocation of just the garage, we're, we've got other buildings on that property that are in need of repair. There hasn't been any attention given to those for several years. We're about 50 to 80 years old in some instances, and it will require significant investments in capital dollars. And what I did was I had, um, our um, physical services, our public works side, kind of break down what those estimated costs were for you, so you had a rough understanding of things that will be coming up within the next few years. We also have a, a large environmental liability by occupying such an industrial use close to the drinking water in Kirkland Lake, so there's, there's the gas tanks, and we also have um, the sand and, and salt, which could prevent or could cause some hazards to the drinking water. Um, with all this being said, we also uh, were, were looking over to our fire chief and the fire master plan that was done in 2017. So on page 49 of that plan, there was a, um, an emphasis to replace the fire hall within five years. So plans need to be made within five years. I've attached that on Schedule C. Uh, so we were, we were wondering whether there'd be benefits and um, part of this analysis was looking at whether we can merge those two departments together and benefit from having a combined area. So the rest of the op, uh, report kind of discusses our initial review of um, different par procurement documents where other municipalities have done this, uh, benefits of site location that we decided to choose. There was a few locations that we reviewed. We did choose Archer Drive, uh, from my understanding, and, and is Rob here tonight? Rob, no, you're here. Okay. I'll, uh, we can follow up with Rob and hopefully um, get those answers if you have any, but he did specify that there was no concerns from a access to um, a response time. There shouldn't be any issues there. Uh, there's, and he did follow up with, I think he said he fired, or followed up with the Ontario Fire Marshal's office to determine whether there's um, any, any, any standard that he needed to meet, and they, they said no, there was no issues there. So the benefits of the site location, you're an appropriate distance from the urban area. It's already serviced with, sorry, I should tell you where I'm thinking of going. <laughs> I'm speaking too fast. So there is a property in Archer Drive that uh, was, um, that was set up for a, for a former uh, development, but it, that has not gone through. Uh, so right now we have a service lot on Archer Drive that we'd like to make use of. Uh, it is located directly beside the FedEx building, so it's to the east of the FedEx. 
Uh, benefits include the property being serviced topographically. Uh, there is a need for geotechnical investigation, but it's a better alternative to other areas in town. We have um, direct access to the snow dump, which is right next door on Archer. There's room for expansion. There's the removal of the hazard of uh, the stealth storage and underground gas tanks at the uh, physical services building. We get to remove our encroachments from the hospital land. And then there's the potential sale of our Dunfield property and fire hall, which could yield revenues to assist with relocation. So we did look at other areas. Uh, one that was brought up was the dog park. Services are very close to where the dog park is located. That's why it was look they we looked at that one specifically. Uh, but because of the gas and hydro lines that are to the rear of that property, the building is just too large and we didn't have enough room. So the building footprint would have been too big and we wouldn't have enough uh, depth to be able to accommodate all of our uses. Uh, we also looked at uh, just north of the railway to the west of Airport Road, which was also triggered as a potential area for industrial activity um, through our uh, community improvement plan funding application. We did a pre-feasibility study and they identified that area as a potential area for a new industrial park. We uh, looked at that, however, there was issues with access to the property. We would have had to acquire access for ownership so we can get access and the services would have also need to be extended planning applications likely would have also been necessary we also looked at privately owned property along highway 66 as an option but again we'd have to buy the land and there'd be planning applications necessary and we're running into the issue of no services so there are some benefits of joint tenancy which i've identified here and i try i'll try not to read through it because i know how um how boring that might be for you so uh, it, uh, it, there's various of, uh, various reasons why we're thinking of putting those together. Um, I guess looking at the future and moving forward and establishing a process for implementation, uh, we did run into a few examples of municipalities uh, lumping the um, design, build, and the financing of the project as a whole. Uh, there are sev several benefits associated with doing so. Um, when you have the design and build together, you have you kind of uh, eliminate the challenges with miscommunication between the firms and better control over design errors or omissions. So if something was forgotten in the architectural side of things, typically because it's the same company that you're working with, they're able to rectify the situation without having to add incurred co or additional costs. The idea of lumping financing in, this came in as a, just as an option to present to council because we are in the state that we are in. Uh, by doing the financing with, um, with this whole process, we have uh, the ability of um, the costs being considered deferred payments and not debt. So it doesn't affect our debt ratio that's imposed by the ministry. They also uh, transfer, all the, we also transfer all the financial risks over to the private sector. So it's subject to fluctuations in interest rates and availability of funding. That all becomes the responsibility of the, um, of the developer. So I don't expect council to make a big decision on this right now. It, right now, all I'm looking for is to see whether this is a direction council would like to go in. And then I can start pricing it out, getting some designs established and, uh, and, and developing potentially a request for proposals to figure out final costs that are associated with this type of relocation. So it's a big project, I understand that, and I'm definitely not looking for an answer right now. But if you'd like to uh, discuss it, if you want more information brought to the table, I'm more than happy to do that. Ashley, <coughs> could you clarify uh, where does that leave the planning and engineering department? Though? That would be in this building in so as well. Yeah. So it'll be. Yeah, the whole office building site. would be on in one location with fire. Because uh, looking at the list of repairs that uh, you had for the buildings there, yeah, uh, they were considerable. Mm -hmm. uh, I I'd just like to note. Uh, I had the pleasure, I'll call it pleasure, but Steve took me around to the uh, works department garage. Mm. Uh, it's deplorable. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't feel our workers should, anybody should have to work in those conditions. Mm -hmm. It is in worse shape than, than the uh, fire hall, that's for sure. And the fire hall's not in very good shape mm -hmm. either, so uh, we can't keep kicking the can down the road but it is a big project, so I understand the, the, the fear. Open to council, yeah. uh, Councilor Owen. Yeah, I'm all in favor of uh, bundling 
more than one operation in one location. It's, it's often done with fire halls. Um, fire halls and libraries and, and fire halls and community centers and, and whatever. My big concern is we don't have, we've got what? Counting the dog park, three industrial lots left, mm -hmm. Ashley? Yep. And Not much. we've already used how many for the uh, solar farm? We used three lots for that as well. And now we're proposing to use one of the three left yep. that is probably the most desirable um, for something other than industrial development and I'm that that's my concern maybe we're gonna have to look at purchasing private land I don't know but I'm all in favor of of making it one home that makes sense but I just really concerned about using another industrial lot mm -hmm. and the most desirable of the three we have left. Councillor Havanoff? Yeah, Ashley, I also understand the, the police are looking at something for a building. Is that potentially? I would have to, I'd have to inquire. Okay. I, I don't there know. There was the rumors that they were looking to get a, a newer building or an, another okay. building. I can look into it. So. I mean, I'm just thinking if you're going to start getting a project, you might as well include everything you can, mm -hmm. and, and having the fire hall and a police station side by side is not a bad thing. Yeah, we haven't, uh, in a, any of our meetings, uh, Rick and I haven't, that subject hasn't come up, but we are meeting with them next week. Uh, Councillor Casey. Just Owens. a quick comment. I agree with Councillor <coughs> Owen on it's time that we take this seriously and move forward. I'm not a fan of the location. Okay. Uh, there's question marks that are popping up on my head on that one, but we need to move forward with this, and the sooner the better. Oh, you're entitled to. I, j I don't <laughs> like personally. I've, I've got some stuff that I'd like to. We have to look into first, but I'm not. Yeah. So uh, for later. Anyway. Councillor Perrier. I'm just curious, do you have any kind of a, and I would never hold you to this, but uh, a ballpark figure, how much? You know, and uh, I'd like to see the fire hall built in Swastika. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor White. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we've definitely kicked uh, this issue down the road far enough. Um, like everything else, it seems to be coming to a head in 2019. 2020, but it's 50 and 80 year old buildings that we're talking about. Is it possible to get like a design plan together mm -hmm. without specifically including like the plot of land mm -hmm. specifically? Is that a thing that can happen? So that was something that we would be <coughs> allocating that 79,000 we have in capital right now towards is looking at like an art, what do we need? And then that would form the basis of the RFP. So it's not a matter of going to RFP right now, it's a matter of what do we need? and we need to do uh, geotechnical. So once we have, that's part, of the, the geotechnical is very important for the whatever property we decide, so that has to be specific, but the architectural rendering, it's, and it's not a ready to go final design, it's a, okay, what do we need? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we talk uh, design plan, uh, is this similar to the project that uh, uh, FedEx did? I don't believe FedEx, owns the building I think they yeah have. it's similar yeah yeah so it's a it's a 25 year uh, you own it at the end of the 25 years um, or you have an option to buy uh, is there the op in that type of uh, program uh, lending program it's lending really uh, to some extent I guess uh, is there options to buy yeah yeah at the end yep Maybe a dollar. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if I, <laughs> not I'd have quite, to look into the, those details. I think those are all things you could stipulate in the RFP on exactly what you're looking for. But yeah, there is the option to purchase. The great thing about this too, from an operational standpoint, is something breaks down in those 25 years, it's not our cost. It's not something that we're budgeting for. It's all taken care of. Yeah, 25 years, yeah. <laughs> if you want it, yeah. So is this like a uh, public partner? partnership 
public, yeah, more pri or less. public private or whatever the that PVB is. You're the tenant essentially, but then okay. if you're a tenant of a lease, it's a, but it's, I've, um, I've looked into two other municipalities that have done it. So I've seen a couple of RFPs that have gone out. One was Tilsonburg and the other one was Mississauga. So I've looked into it a couple, there are municipalities out there taking advantage of this because it's not affecting their debt ratio. People are all in the same, municipalities are all in that same boat where they're, they're, they're factoring that in, right? So I can say for sure, I have not seen an RFP that will deal with a public works garage or a uh, fire hall. This is more to do with town halls or I think there was um, another office building in Mississauga, but it's just a factor to consider something we found that was creative. <laughs> Just going back to what uh, Councillor Owen had mentioned about concerns about using up the industrial uh, yeah. lamp. Uh, unfortunately, our CAO isn't here tonight, but I thought we were working yep, on we on uh, uh, some future plans mm -hmm. to develop more, more land. So some of you may remember the community improvement plan funding that we did receive actually included a, a pre-feasibility study for industrial land. So there are two, ident two areas were identified, which is south of Archer and along Highway 66. So moving, um, bringing roads down along Archer and then and doing some development behind FedEx and behind uh, this property and other <coughs> properties. And then along Highway 66 to a certain extent and wrapping around Roscoe. So that was one area. The other one was, like I said, on High uh, Goodfish. So to the west of Goodfish, but there is some private properties there that we'd have to acquire in order to accommodate it. And when they looked at both of them, they said Archer was better. Just from a servicing standpoint, we'd have a lot less headaches. So it when is look, it's, it is being looked at. It's a matter of how much do we want to put into servicing <coughs> these properties, developing a new industrial park. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is there some kind of grants available for uh, development of industrial? I thought we had got some money for our original uh, or expansion. Uh, no, I, I would. I have no idea. I have to look into it, but I can. I can take a look and see whether there's anything available. Okay, Councillor Owen. Yeah, Dennis just mentioned this, but I was going to mention it anyways. North on Goodfish makes absolutely no sense to me because you're adding a railway track mm -hmm. between where the fire department would be located mm -hmm. and the bulk of the residents and the industry. Yeah. Yes, Dennis. <laughs> Man, mm -hmm. I started with Dennis mention it. I was going to, but to <laughs> me that that location makes yep, makes no sense from a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons yeah. we chose our church. Um, my problem with the industrial location is we only have three lots. Yes, we have things in future planning, but if an industry decides next week or next year they want to locate here, they're not going to wait five years for us to develop that mm -hmm. proposed lots. Mm -hmm. So that's my big problem with locating it there. Yeah. It's not uh, serviceability, like for the f I'm, I'm not as concerned about the works garage as I am with the fire department. It has to be in a good location, ideally. Um, but I just, I don't wanna use yeah. something we don't have to so or could only, sell. My only response to that, and it's not, it's a, of the times right now and maybe not into the future, depending on where the interior government goes, is when a private uh, industry comes in, there's generally a good chance of 90% funding to bring services to the property. There is no funding for municipal. <laughs> so that was my only... But but like I say, if they make a decision to come here and there's no lot available, yeah. they're not going to wait five years or three years or ten years for us to develop that lot. So that's why I think it's kind of key we keep those industrial lots. We've already used three, well four if you count Dog Park, but that's movable. Um, Depending who you ask. Well, <laughs> I've asked pretty much every councillor here, and they've all agreed with me that the dog park's movable. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I have a resolution that's moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier. The council has received a preliminary report on possible locations for the works garage and fire hall relocation and approve that staff look further into the project and continue communications with council. All in favor? Passed. Main Street uh, funding change in project. 
Okay, so this is just a change in project scope. Um, as some of you may remember, we received Main Street revitalization funding, a, a total of $44,705.94. When we did the capital budget, our intent was to allocate this money towards accessibility and tactile plates, the installation of tactile plates along Government Road. Uh, we ran into a little bit of challenges along the way. Uh, we had um, key staff take on additional duties. We the RFP took a little bit to get out. We needed to get some designs uh, completed in order to do the RFP. And by the time uh, and when we did finally issue the RFP, we didn't get anyone to bid on it. So uh, at this point, we've contacted individuals or con uh, contractors that would be able to do the work. Uh, they're booked solid until March, which we have a deadline of March to be able to get this completed. So what I was hoping to well, bring as, an, bring as a suggestion to Council is under the operating budget, we had $20,000 budgeted for the, repurpose to, for the purpose of reconstructing sidewalks. And again, because we had key staff taking on additional responsibilities, we weren't able to get those reconstructed sidewalks done this year. We're not gonna get them done. So now we have um, sort of a deficiency within our operating budget. My suggestion was we take the money we spent on tactile plates, and I believe it was about 3,500 in design and the remainder in purchasing, sorry, I guess about 10 grand in tactile plates throwing that into the operating budget, finishing those projects next year within the operating, but then taking the money and putting it towards the installation of audible pedestrian crossings at four intersections, and that did come up as a, as a when are we doing this, uh, previous site council, so we thought this would be an excellent opportunity to implement that. So the we did get a quote, and I, did I include the quote in here? I don't know if I did. Uh, it was 44, thousand seven hundred and five so it's right in oh, sorry that's how much funding we received uh, was it 41 41 thousand is what it would cost to get those four intersections done and that was pending the only thing that was um, a conditional was making sure that the wires were long enough correct the underground wires had to be long enough to be able to do that otherwise there'd be an additional cost there I am totally in support of this one uh, I'm actually a teacher for the blind and the qualified, I used to teach the blind. There is a need in the community, for not just for one individual, but for several individuals that are either losing their eyesight in their later age or a younger group of people. And uh, I, this is a move forward to making sure that we're complying come 2025, 20, I believe it is. And yeah, I support this one. I, I agree. Uh, and I think, Casey, I'm pleasantly surprised that the cost is a lot more reasonable. And I think that's why it was kicked down the road for yeah. a number <coughs> of years. My research has shown, because I was comparing, because I had an interview a few weeks ago, actually, on the subject with CBC News, and the cost I got were from Windsor, and they were just out of the world, like expensive yeah. for these lights. So I, I was, when I saw this, I was actually quite surprised at the relatively low cost of them. Uh, Councillor Owen. Yeah, I'm all in favor of the audible. My only concern is sidewalks in this town are in terrible shape in a lot of places. And a lot of residents have approached me about getting the sidewalks fixed. And for whatever reason, and I'm not laying blame because I'm sure there's good reasons, sidewalks seem to fall in the low end of priority. And now, we're, if I understand this correctly, we're going to take 20000 that was allocated to fix up sidewalks and, and use a good portion of that for something else, which I don't have a problem with as long as we're going to replace that next year in the budget with 20000 because the sidewalks need work. And it's a, we have a bylaw in this town that says people with motorized... Uh, uh, scooters basically have to ride on the sidewalks and yet there's an probably I was going to say majority but that would be an exaggeration a large number of the sidewalks aren't safe for them to use um, it's also a problem for people with sight problems when you've got uneven broken sidewalks it's a problem with people who are using uh, canes or walkers. You ever tried to push a walker along an all broken up sidewalk? It's uh, 
It's so that's my only concern. I'm all in favor of the audible. First time I heard them when, was in Aurelia, and I thought I'd had another nervous breakdown because I couldn't figure out where these noises were coming from. But no, I'm in favor of that. But I'm just concerned about taking once again taking money out of sidewalk repair and how we can move sidewalks higher on our list of priorities because it something you know we got a senior population here okay. councillor white sorry um speaking about the sidewalks um during the budget process we i learned that there is about 17 employees in the public works department um that probably is a real issue as to why many of these projects aren't aren't being completed they are stretched very very thin and my understanding is they cut all the grass, they do all the painting, they do all the signs, they do all the cement work, they do all. So that's speaking to, I think, a bigger issue right there. That yes, these things that the public sees as number one priority is falling way um, to the bottom of the list. Perhaps it's time to think about contracting out general laborers to get them done during the summer. Uh, rather than just hiring students, I think it's a bigger issue than just, you know, a priority list. Everything's a high priority. Everything, right? Yeah. But with only 17 people in the entire department, I think we really have to kind of to cut our workers some slack. I hate, to, I hate to be the one to say that in public, but it's true. There is 17 people in that department. So getting back to the actual report, I think this is brilliant. I work with the elderly. I work with um, people with uh, different levels of abilities. This is going to go a very long way for them. So this is perfect. And I, I do agree with uh, Councillor Owen about, uh, and I think on our budget negotiations that we go into this in the next month or so, uh, that this is high on the priority list, the sidewalks, and we do set aside, replace that money that we want to use for this project. Obviously, we weren't going to get the sidewalks done, finished by year end, but uh, we can't turn a blind eye to it. It's got to be taken care of. It's a, pri a priority again. I have a motion that's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The Council approves the change in project scope for the Main Street Revitalization Initiative to audible pedestrian crossings at four intersections. Duncan in government, Prospect in government, Wendy in government, and Maine in government. All in favor? Approved. A few more, I promise. Getting there. Okay, this next one should be relatively easy. 62nd Street East, we have a request to lease this property. This is a surplus property. It's on a surplus lands list. It has been for several years. The building was demolished in November 2015 for a total cost of about $10,000. It's uh, been sitting vacant and there hasn't been any interest from any other pub public member of the public uh, with developing the lands. So the owner of 59 Second Street is requesting to, he requested to purchase uh, for, for the purpose of constructing a parking lot for his tenants. Um, being a 60 by 120 lot from a planning perspective, I'm suggesting that we keep it as surplus land because that is a beautiful sized property for development. Um, but with there being no interest, we thought for the time being we would lease. Uh, so he's requested that he get first right of refusal to purchase the property if we ever did get a request to purchase whether or not that's something council wants to entertain that is up to you uh, it right now is drafted in there because that's what he requested uh, other than that I'm not sure if you guys have any questions on this one councillor Ivanov I mean this property is across the street from the existing yes. mm -hmm. yeah and I think we were I think recall us asking if there are any other people on yep wanted to rent it nobody else interested no we circulated okay. and gave them three weeks Good ask, yeah. yeah thank you councilor rowan i'm all in favor of uh of leasing the property but not giving him the first right of refusal because i would like to see someday a house located there and it's a nice flat building lot and we don't have a lot of flat building lots in town there was a basement i don't know how deep it was in the building that previously stood there so there is potential f for a house with a basement even. So 
That would be my thoughts. Mind you, first right of refusal doesn't mean much to him. We still have to approve the sale. <laughs> yeah, I, but I know what you're saying. we're giving, now correct me if I'm wrong, and Ashley, you would know better than me. What he's asking for is the first right to purchase that land should we put it up for sale, right? Well, why would we put ourselves in that position? So maybe I can clarify. What, what he would want is if somebody came in and decided, I'm going to build a house on this property, they would say, okay, I'm going to pay the town five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. He wants first right refusal so he can come back and buy it. But my concern would be he's going to build a parking lot for five or $10,000 versus buy, build a house for five, ten thousand $10,000. So I'm not sure how you'd word it legally in order to make it yeah. hold up. But yeah, they, they, he'd likely get it for the same price somebody wants to build a house for. Councillor Ivanov? Yeah, I agree with Rick. I think uh, we shouldn't allow him to have first-party refusal because that's exactly what would happen. He would have somebody say, I want to build a house, and I'm going to spend uh, 350000 to build a house, and he's going to say, I want a $5,000 parking lot, and he'll keep it. So, you know, and or he could sell it to the person who wanted to build the house for more money if there's somebody that makes an offer. So I would just say, you know, let's just give him the, the right to lease it until we decide to sell it. It just complicates it, I agree. Mm -hmm. Councilor Rowan. And uh, since this is in my neighborhood, uh, my keen sense of observation is that it is currently being used by his tenants as a parking lot mm -hmm. uh, without our permission. So I don't well, think I don't think we really owe him a lot of favors. Like if he wants to lease it, lease it. But he's been using it when he's been told that that's not to be used as a parking lot. So. I believe there was a number of users, yeah, right? But he has been using it. I agree. Uh, there's one company that he leases to, and then there's us. Yeah. Yeah. That'll come back then as a bylaw. We just need to make note that we're not doing first right of use, or okay. I know you'll take care of it. Uh, sorry, Rick will do this one. This is just a, a simple report uh, for your information on how the uh, fall free tipping fee event went at the landfill site. Um, this year, the, the, fee, the free event in the fall took place between September 23rd and uh, 29th. We also included one Sunday uh, from 8 till 12 noon. Um, again, the residents took full advantage. It was busy. Um, the total waste disposal disposed of at the landfill site was 1,442 cubic meters, uh, equaling 708 vehicles uh, that went through the gate uh, to, to dump for free. And additionally, two, two bins of electronics were uh, taken away from the uh, physical services yard for a combined total of 2.32 tons of uh, waste electronics that was diverted from the landfill site. Any questions? No. You would con <laughs> you consider it a success? It's it's yeah. always it's yeah uh, yeah it's it's always successful. Spring, fall, people people do what they do, and it uh, works out great. Okay. Thank you. winter maintenance plan yeah okay so I just I did pull it up really quickly and I did leave just to make copies but the report wasn't attached I'm not sure if everyone saw the report I Nothing fancy in the report. It just basically outlines what the proposed changes were that were presented in the winter maintenance manual. Uh, we did receive some comments from the public noting that the schedules weren't attached. There are no changes to the schedules. That's why they were not attached. 
uh, and we will get new updated copies of this with the schedules once uh, or if it gets approved. So the uh, just a brief background, last December we passed the winter maintenance plan to guide winter op operations for 2019. It went relatively well. Um, the total accumulation in snow that fell in Kirkland was record breaking. So for, th for that, I feel like it went pretty well. Uh, prior to moving forward, however, with winter operations for 2020, uh, there's a, a recommendation that we be more consistent with the provincial minimum maintenance standards. So there were some uh, modifications proposed. So when we developed the winter maintenance manual or plan back in 2019, we were keeping the existing uh, service levels that we've been that have been in place since forever. Um, so we originally had five centimeters um, depth. So we would we would plow the roads at five centimeters depth. The provincial rec our provincial standard is eight. So they're recommending that we go from five to eight. That would be for sidewalks as well. Uh, the we also modified the uh, title of the manager of infrastructure to general manager of public clerks to be in line with the posting that's currently out or I think it just closed uh, we've got uh, additions of tables just because they were they're, they're reflected in the provincial maintenance stand or minimum maintenance standards but I didn't include them originally in the report so I've added those in uh, we added the Highway Traffic Act as a legislation that must be followed um, the modified the sorry modified the sidewalk planning as well from eight to five centimeters so as I came here I did get comments uh, regarding these changes back from the Tennessee Health Unit they're not happy with us reducing our service level uh, they say from a uh, perspective of our um, age-friendly plan and our official plan we should be promoting uh, better winter maintenance on our sidewalks so I um, I wasn't able to address her concerns. The other things that she did mention were the addition of, a, of um, more sidewalks that should be maintained in the winter. I'm not going to address that today. I'll bring it up as a separate report if I find it's needed or we can look at it uh, moving forward in the future or during budget deliberations. Uh, and I will respond back to her and let her know that, um, that we will consider those at a later date, not, not tonight. So I, um, I do have Steve here to help me out if he has, if there's questions at all. Is there questions at all? Councillor Owen? Okay. I already noticed this as a problem after our first snowstorm, uh, snow, f wasn't storm, but snow that accumulated under uh, garbage and recycling bins. So I'm going to mention this at a public meeting so people get the hint. You do not put your garbage or recycling bins on the road. Okay, I've already seen a number of them that were knocked over by plows. And you can't blame the plow driver for that. Set them back a bit from the road so there's room for the uh, snow, uh, what do you call that, Steve? The, uh, for the wind roll. Okay, use some common sense, please. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, then we go a little further in the report, repairing property damage. And it's down um, in the second paragraph, the last sentence, the town does not repair, replace sod damage due to the application of sand, salt, or other de-icing chemicals. I know that we did do some of that this spring. I wasn't happy about it. Um, but it's in our policy that we do not do that. So I'm hoping residents will realize that yes, we use salt and sand on the roads to keep them safe in the winter time. And yes, it does get plowed onto what I call the boulevard, whether there's a sidewalk or not, but that's town owned property. And yes, it can result in grass kill, but we can't afford to go around and and resoil and seed everybody's property. So I'm hoping residents will realize that in the future and that town staff won't be harassed into doing it because I'm sure that's what has happened in the past. Um, I am concerned about this parking bylaw section. It says residents shall refrain from parking on boulevards and sidewalks as per the town parking bylaw. Parking on boulevards and sidewalks at any point of the day inhibits staff from being able to implement winter maintenance plan. I know traditionally in the wintertime people have been allowed to 
to park on boulevards. Um, it's done on my street. It's done on pretty much every street you go on. So I'm not, like, I just would like clarification on that because it's in our policy telling people you can't do it, and yet we've always turned a blind eye to it in the wintertime. So, and then in the, the last uh, paragraph, there's no bylaw. It says on first conviction, on second conviction, on third conviction, they will be charged. Well, there's been no conviction if there hasn't been any charges. So I think we need to change the wording there. It's just a, a technicality, but um, because I was, when I first started reading it, I thought, oh, on first conviction? Oh, so they've gone to court once, right? But no, they haven't gone to court yet. So you're basically, you're giving them, um, you, you've laid out a process whereby the bylaw enforcement will visit their, the homeowner, and then the second time they'll give them written notice, and on the third time they're gonna give them a ticket. And, and that's great to have a procedure written out. And I think that's all I have, Ashley. Councilor Owens. Uh, just a couple clarifications I need. Uh, first, to comment on uh, Mr. Uh, Councilor Owen, his beef or his problem with the garbage bins, you have to take into consideration that certain parts of town from lack of poor design back in the 20s or whenever, don't have a f yeah. driveway or something, so it needs to be put on the street. Yeah. Yes, you have to use common sense, but they have to go on the street. Like, I don't have a choice. My garbage has to go on the street. I don't have a driveway to put it in. So yeah. Yeah. so if it gets knocked over, then it sucks on me. I have to yeah. pick it up and stand it back up for the truck. Um, for the standards here, time-wise, as to when streets have to be cleared, uh, I, I've got tremendous respect for our road crew. They do an amazing work, and I know the storm we got on Friday, you don't call it a storm. It's a snow day. It's a storm. Um, it, it, it created a lot of challenges uh, for our staff. Um, how, I just I need clarification as to why it was decided that the minimum standard wouldn't be met because certain streets are like we're 20 48 many hours past the storm itself it hasn't necessarily stopped snowing and certain streets or parts of town haven't haven't been clear so i think for the public i think the information needs to be put out there uh, as to why this time it wasn't respected or wasn't put in force or wasn't <coughs> followed I don't know how to put it or how to word it properly, so that I, I just want the information to be out there. I'll let Steve comment and <coughs> if you want, and then uh, mm -hmm. what we could try to do is, if it's something, I'll, I'll let him do it first, and then okay. I'll comment. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, the, s the snowfall amount that we received on the Friday was uh, triggered us to go out plowing at approximately 3.30 in the a.m. Um, the, temperatures, the temperatures that we encountered um, were, it was warmer overnight, and as the snow fell, it turned to a slush, and unfortunately, uh, slush and snow removal equipment don't get along very well. Um, we had a lot of difficulty. Uh, one of our pieces of equipment uh, slid backwards down a hill, uh, hit a pole, uh, and damaged the pole. It's just the circumstances in that same piece of equipment when it was turning the corner onto Second Street, backing up, slid uh, again. Uh, we have our brand new loader that uh, came in, has uh, brand new Michelin Snow X tires, which are probably the best tires you can put on any piece of equipment for snow removal, and, and he was sliding. Uh, what we've had, I had reports of truck drivers doing pirouettes down streets. It was, I, I likened it to a dog fight. It was just, we're just miserable. We have some new um, new operators that were having difficulty, um, and we also ha I also had to recruit uh, two st staff members that are usually in the garage, one to go in a loader and the other one to go in the sander to try and stay ahead of the the, the game. Um, unfortunately, some um, parts the streets were opened up, not completed as well as they should have been, and I've been trying to, to catch up. Uh, for the 
the last few days to do that. Um, trying to get it down to bare pavement so that we don't have a, a fight with ice uh, like as we've had in the past. We've pretty much accomplished it. The weather sort of held off, but it's, uh, it, I can't say it won't happen again, but it's, this was sort of a one-off. That's a miserable, uh, miserable fight, and we did the best that we could with the crew that we have, and uh, I think they did an amiable job. I know a, a lot of them were, were pretty, their nerves were jangled at the end of the day because if you have a plow truck with a wing down and you're going, and you're doing circles in a street, it, it, it's a little unnerving. It's impressive uh, to see. Like I, I saw it on my street. I like the. Pl I've never yeah. seen a plow maneuver that way. Yeah. I don't think it was intentional on his part, but it was yeah. impressive yeah. to see from inside my house. No, it's so <laughs> I, I acknowledge, but yeah. couldn't the trucks go out the next day and finish? Like, wouldn't have that have been? Well, we did actually. What we did, we didn't want the trucks to go out. It was, uh, and the other, th the other thing that complicated it quite a bit was uh, the reason why some of it didn't look as well is that when we had started, we had plowed, but the way the snow was blowing it looked like we hadn't showed up about 10 or 15 mm -hmm. minutes later. So there was, there was that, uh, plus, um, plus there was a lot of vehicles in the way. Uh, unfortunately, yes. the, uh, I, and I will and bring that, another question. Those, are, those aren't difficult to see because you sort of see lumps in the street. Yeah. Uh, I, and unfortunately, what I've been trying to do is, we, I've sent the grader out for the last two days trying to clean some of okay. those up. And some of the, 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 the roads that are easier to do that, and he's accomplished it, and some of them we have to still catch up with, and that's certainly our intention. And on a regular plow, this doesn't happen. Like we don't, we don't have this conversation where the street may have been sort of half plowed. Yeah. Uh, we do both sides; it all gets done. But this was again an exception, and, and uh, I perhaps we could have handled it differently. But with the situation that we find ourselves in, it was the, the we did we did the very best, and we didn't do too badly. From judging from the complaints that we that we got, I know councillors probably got a few more. And, uh, yeah, take on and, and too. again, uh, it wasn't. Uh, we were dealing with a little bit of lack of experience. Okay. And uh, and of course, I put uh, I put one loader operator was the mechanic. Uh, he did the he did the job that job 20 years ago or so, and he was good enough to step up and and, and fill in. Uh, so that's. Can I just add? Things. I know this was brought up by Councillor Adams before. When we, if it does come back up to discussion about this exemption or official exemption of parking on the streets on holidays that we keep this in mind that we remember like I mean this storm was on the surprise like they had two days notice they could have moved their vehicles but for whatever reason people choose to ignore it park on the street and then have the audacity to complain one snowed in well <laughs> use common sense so just can we keep this in mind that this was it is a problem and you end up with snow banks that are 10 15 feet outside the middle of the street and it's a problem. Councillor White. Sorry, I do have a question about. So I've been noticing like the streets are bare now for the most part, but because like on the side streets or the sides of the street, they're not like down the middle, but where everybody parks now, of course we have snow banks because people got caught. They they parked on October thirty first, not November first, in the middle of you know. Uh, they were there, so now we have this snow. Do we go back and collect that early in the season? Like yeah, as I, as I said earlier, some, some spots we will remove, but some spots what I do is I'll send out equipment, either loader or the grader, to push those back when the vehicles aren't in the way. So we're sort of picking and choosing how we, how we can do it, uh, but our intention is to get those banks out of our way because if they do solidify into ice, it makes it much more miserable to do, and it, it makes the travel portion of the road uh, a little more difficult to maintain. So, yes, to answer your question. <laughs> Councillor Owen? Yeah, I don't want Steve to go home really sad, so I'm going to tell you, Steve, and this is the truth, and it happened at Tim Horton, so we know it's the truth. It's more reliable than <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> I had a lady tell me what a great job the town did plowing the snow. And I tell you where she lived, but I don't want one of your plow drivers to get a big head. I want them all to share in the glory. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are we looking to? 
I have a resolution yes. actually that approves the winter maintenance manual as you presented, but are you coming back with amendments? Is, are there, is as, as it is, the way that you want it to go, or are you going to? Uh, well, I, can okay. I can look at uh, reviewing that uh, on first conviction language, and I think I have a couple other notes from Rick here as well. Parking on boulevards, I'm not necessarily, I think it's it's still applicable because most of the time it's not allowed, but maybe I can come back and, and where, like at, for parking on boulevards, like, do you mean like people perpendicular parking on, yeah. over right. them? Right on the uh, I'll give you the example because we used to live on 15 Allen. There was no, you're right beside the laneway and you have no driveway. So That's right. people pull up right in front and right. park there illegally, right? Against the bylaw. Okay. So, sorry. Councillor Owen. Okay, on 3rd Street, right across the road from me, um, he plows off what appears to be his front lawn, but it's actually all town owned property yeah. within six inches of the front of his house. Yeah. Uh, and he parks there. Okay, so that technically is the boulevard or it's town owned property, it's not a driveway. If he doesn't do that, he's got nowhere to park. Mm -hmm. um, you go further, uh, the group home, two, three doors up, they paved all that section, but it's town owned. Mm -hmm. They have no parking lot if we enforce that. Mm -hmm. If you go another, uh, right next to the group home, he plows off the boulevard with his truck. Mm -hmm. He has a driveway, but he parks one vehicle there and other one in his driveway. If you go to the house next to that, their whole front yard, which a good portion is town owned property, is done in paving bricks. And that's their parking space. So that's that's why I brought this up because and you know what I don't want to see my neighbor lose to be able to park in front of his house like it's it's not causing a problem for anybody and he's really good with his snow removal he's not putting it on neighbors and stuff and I don't want to see the group home not be able to park in front of their house because then they're going to park on a street that's too narrow and I don't want to see my other neighbor that made an improvement to their house by bricking their whole front lawn be told they can't park there because they don't have a driveway like so I just I'm not sure where where we go with that policy I know it's it's there but do we modify it or do we do we choose to ignore it in certain cases I think in the past we just it's been there but we just chose to ignore it during the winter time but we also need to ignore it in the summertime too in some of these cases I just mentioned so that's why I mention it so in terms of changes to the policy, I almost wonder, because it says as per the town's parking bylaw, I would automatically refer back to that to see whether or not it's applicable. So that would mean my parking bylaw is not right. My, this might be, but my parking bylaw may. But again, it comes down to, do like, well, and we ran into this problem with bylaw enforcement before where, well, this is the rule. It's like, well, use some common sense. It's where else is he going to park? So there is a lot of that that happens with bylaws. Um, yeah, like if I wanted to pick, if, if I got mad at my neighbor, I could phone the bylaw that. officer because yeah. I know parked he's parked illegally, mm -hmm. right? And I don't want, I don't want to leave us open to that. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, I know it's not an easy solution, but no. it, you know, maybe we just leave it there for now and we work on it, you know, down the road. Yeah. Uh, let me try and look through the parking bylaw, and I am working very diligently with bylaw enforcement right now because. She is on street par and, and par issuing tickets and making people angry. Um, so, and she has noticed there are a few areas where she's like, well, where else are they gonna park? Yeah. What are we doing in these situations? So we are trying to rectify them a little bit and get some sort of knowledge. Uh, so leave it with me and I'll try to, I'll try to come up with something. Yeah. Councillor Ivanov. Yeah, I know you mentioned you're gonna talk to Timis Community Health Unit regarding the yep. sidewalks. Yep. And so I, I, I noticed you kind of eliminated that when you're speaking. I just want to make sure that we, because I have a concern about eight centimeters of snow on the sidewalk. Okay. Um, I think that's, a, you know, when you start getting three, four inches of snow on a sidewalk, it gets to be pretty treacherous for most people. I know some businesses clean theirs on Government Road. Uh, many of them don't. And there's a couple of empty, well, lots of empty holes there where nothing gets done if it wasn't for the street or for the sidewalk plow. It would be full of snow. 
Go into the ruins. If we remove, just to come back to the, the <coughs> Boulevard part, if we remove that from the <coughs> bylaw in any way, shape, or form, does that impede snow removal? Because I know s that area is designed to put snow on. That's what, like, if you're pushing okay. the snow off to the side, that's where it goes, so it's off the street. So now if we remove that and open it to anybody that can park there, is that going to create mm -hmm. more frustrated plow operators? Yep. So I... I I just want we I think we have to really yeah really we have to thread lightly on that one before we remove something and have it it's very case by case yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's like the midnight to seven in the morning thing where the park in front of the park yep yep don't you wrong um if we're gonna readdress uh, the amount of snow on the sidewalk. I think we should readdress whether or not we should be offering that service. Um, that's an optional service. Many, many communities have a bylaw that stipulates that the owner of the house or the business has to clear the sidewalk and they have to do it by a certain time of day. And, you know, we're looking at trying to keep costs down to rate payers. And, right, I know. Well, we may have, we, but somebody might own those properties they're still responsible and even if we do own them we're cutting down on our costs we have to look at every possible way that we can save money for all the ratepayers in town and that's definitely if we're going to revisit sidewalks i think we should revisit because right now it's a patchwork like so and so pays taxes here but he doesn't get his sidewalk cleared <coughs> But so-and-so over here pays taxes at the same rate, and he gets his cleared. So it's not really a fair system to start with, I don't think. So I think we should revisit the whole thing if we're going to look at it. We've added some work for you. Yeah, so I would still suggest passing this as is and then maybe having me do a little bit follow-up research on that. I can bring that back as a report for consideration at Council. and municipalities that offer that if that's the direction council wants to go for sure so <laughs> we're going to bring this back then well i would like to get this passed because winter's here and okay. i'd like to okay. make sure that those standards are you were going to change that language so and pass that with the revisions yes. but can i just make reference in the bylaw yeah, to pass re with revisions, revisions with yeah. revisions as yeah. detailed at council and that'll include the first conviction part So it's moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier. The Council approves the Winter Maintenance Manual Review and Update with revisions as presented by the Manager of Planning and Land Development, and that the Town Planner do follow up and report back to Council. All in favor? Perfect. Yes. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ashley. Introduction, reading, and consideration of bylaws. It's moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier, that, that bylaw 19 106 being a bylaw to establish Council's involvement in the hiring process of treasurer and clerk be read a first, second, and third time <coughs> enacted and passed. Discussion, Councillor just, Owen. Just a quick comment. Um, so, in reading this bylaw, it, it kind of covers a lot of what. The motion I had, or the report, Councillor White and I had presented last week, or had intended to present last week, um, it covers most of what that one was intended to do. So I feel that at this, even though that report that got brought forward did include all positions, and I want to make clear on that 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 was not the original intent. The intent of this policy was really is to, to look at management and upper level positions. It got modified in discussion with the CAO. <coughs> to include everybody i out of respect i put it in there it should not have gone out that way uh but now with this new policy i think it or this new bylaw it will cover the in what this uh report was intended to do so i would remove i have no intentions of bringing that uh or we have no intentions of bringing the report back next week or any other further time it's done deal and it 
Thank you for that uh, clarification, uh, Casey. All in, all in favor? <laughs> Questions uh, from oh, council? Oh, sorry, I have another, <coughs> another sorry. sorry. It's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White, that bylaw 19-107 being a bylaw to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute all documents related to the lease and encroachment at 62nd Street to 2323008 Ontario Incorporated, removing the first right of refusal clause, be read a first, second, and third time, enacted and passed. All in favor? Passed. It's moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier, that bylaw 19-108 being a bylaw to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute all documents related to the groundwater protection on mining claims L39520 and L9910 be read a first, second, third time, enacted and passed. All in favor? Passed. <coughs> Notice of motions? None declared. Confirmation bylaw? It's moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Stacy White, that bylaw 19-109, being a bylaw to confirm proceedings of, of Council at its meeting held November 5th, 2019, be read a first, second, third time, enacted and passed. All in favor? Passed. Councillor's reports? Councillor Owens? Owen, sorry. Yeah, I'm so used to that I now I don't it, even I acknowledge it. Um, this week it was uh, released that three people had left the employ of the town. Um, I just want to make some clarifications on those resignations. Um, all those people gave us notice, so they didn't leave in a huff and all of a sudden. All three resignations take place. One employee is left as of yesterday. One is leaving in late November, and one is leaving at the end of the year. And I just want to clarify, because the way it came out, it almost sounded like we had a crisis on our hands. And what it is, is people moving on in their careers or whatever for various reasons. It's not a reflection of any turmoil within the town in terms of the employees and uh, it, and everybody that's leaving gave us more, well, one gave us a legal notice and the other two gave us way more than the legal notice. So disgruntled employees don't do that. So I just wanted to clarify that for the public. I, I agree, uh, Councillor Owen, and I'd like to thank them, uh, these staff members, for their uh, service that they provided to us. And uh, I agree with what you're saying. Adjournment, or sorry, Councillor Perry. Sorry, my paper. I had it around and it's folding up on me. Anyway, the representative of uh, the hundredth anniversary from Council, I would like to say that the events held, I would call a huge success, and we should be very proud of this work that this committee has put into our hundredth anniversary celebrations. The committee has still three final events to close the year. These events include uh, ne next fri this Friday, November 8th, uh, the Volunteer and Sponsor Appreciation Night. And in two weeks, I, I can't remember the exact date, the, I love them along with the Holy Name Irish alumni that purchased two set of hockey sweaters. Holy Name hockey sweaters, and uh, they have a home and home series with Timmins and they're gonna be raffling these sweaters off at the end of the games. And uh, the final thing is uh, they have a grand finale, a Christmas and dinner show with the Kirkland Lake Arts Council at Northern College. And that's on December the 14th. I was hoping on giving you a financial report, but uh, they're still working on the book, so I can't, I can't come up with that for you. Uh, there was some concern that that some of us thought that maybe the, the committee was supposed to end on September 30th, but uh, I think that was just a miscommunication. 
Uh, there's nothing in writing. We, I had asked Joanne to help me find anything, and she couldn't find anything, so it'll be finished December 14th. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Adjournment. It's moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The Council adjourns its regular meeting of November 5th, 2019 to an in-camera me meeting pursuant to Section 239.2 of the Municipal Block to discuss one possible land acquisition and two items concerning identifiable persons. All in favour? Adjourned.